Uh, they both appreciated the other. They both appreciated that the ultimately those rings wouldn't have been placed on either of their hands without the other. CLNS History is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Right, they weren't necessarily buddy buddy, and I'm sure, I'm not sure, I'm reasonably sure, eight in a scale of ten sure, that it pissed off Kevin whenever Larry would say, you know, Kevin, some year he should come in and want to be the MVP, or he could be the MVP. All those unparalleled moves, those moves that have not been replaced in the last 28 years since he retired, were not, they didn't fall out of the sky. Somebody had to put the work in to develop those moves. And, and, and develop his game. And it's true. That's exactly true. They, they just were different personalities. Uh, Larry didn't understand how Kevin could be laughing and joking until they threw the ball. Up. And Kevin felt Larry needed to get a life a little bit at times. You know what I'm saying? I kind of laughed when Robin asked me to do an escort commercial. You see, I'm six foot nine. An escort's about four foot six. Yep. And, and that's who they were. But, but it, it, they, they didn't have fist fights. They didn't have arguments. Where they, was Parrish? Where was Parrish alive? On his own. Switzerland? Platform. Yep. Um, absolutely. He was Switzerland. Uh, he had his own niche, his own uh, aura of respectability. He didn't get involved in this, you know, at all. The chief just ran the floor, put his hand up, yep. made, blocked his shot. Yeah, Parrish is guarding Jaminski, but Buck Williams is guarding Parrish. As soon as he sees the rebound has gotten, off he goes up the court. Buck Williams way behind Robert Parrish. A guard has to pick up Parrish. And that's... I never saw Larry make a face or vice versa, uh, you know. Not really. I, I knew him so, you know, I just knew Larry obviously more, better than Kevin, but I certainly knew Kevin. He is the most important continuous presence in Boston basketball. Over 18 years now, he has covered about as many games as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has played, and he's as comfortable on the garden floor as the Celtics are. This town's been so blessed. Sure, Larry Bird would have to go. He would have to go up there along with Russell, along with Kuzi, along with Ted Williams, along with Eddie Shore, along with Bobby Orr. I mean, this is a, a legacy unmatched. I have been totally blessed by one very simple fact. Uh, circumstances place me at the Boston Globe to cover the Boston Celtics who over the past 18 years have had a second great era if you will and I've been present for a good portion of it and had the opportunity to write about most of it it's been a, a tremendous vehicle so just go ahead you, you got beer read Bob Ryan go no. That's it, man. we don't Let's read go. it too much during the playoffs through the year yeah but, uh, go. The playoffs. Go. but you knew but you're right about hanging out kind of thing you know I gravitated to the subs guys more. He was, you know, the guys like Brad Lowhouse, Carlisle when he came up, Brad Lowhouse. When I did the book with Larry in, in the summer of 87, I spent a week in French Flick at his house doing the interviews that were the basis for the book. Yeah. And we had, Brad Lowhouse showed up, you know, with, swim in the pool. Yeah. Yeah. I think Carlisle may have showed up, but- Well, like, he liked oh, the oh, grinders. Oh. He liked the grinders, didn't he? Yes. Oh, they were very, they were roommates when they right. had roommates. Super and Larry was kidding when they traded Roby. He said, if they hadn't traded Roby, I never would have been an MVP. <laughs> Roby, Roby and they were drinking buddies. Right, right. There were the main differences between this year and last year in addition to Larry were, of course, the, the uh, signing of ML Carr, who gives you uh, a sixth man type of, of effervescence. He, he fits in so well to the Boston tradition of being a sixth man. Uh, he can play small forward. He comes in, he picks the game up. He can play a little bit of guard. And he's got a great personality, and he relishes this role. He feels like a, a gunfighter coming in or, or, or a cavalry officer or something. He just loves this whole idea of being plugged into the mystique. No, Roby was, and Larry were, they were, they were friendly. So let's flip it back. Is there such a thing as a Celtic mystique, or how would you define whatever the aura of, of the Boston Celtics is? There is some feeling that the Celtics are special. Do you think they're special in, in the NBA and in the sports world? Uh, yeah, they're, they're special. When we were playing, we didn't think of ourselves as special. We knew we were going to win. But we, uh, what was really good about the, to me about the Celtics was that such strong personalities and bright people. I mean, you, if you think that uh, you can take guys like Heinsohn, who's an absolute super human being, a bright man, a very compassionate man, strong personality, and you take all these guys, 
had to make certain sacrifices to work together. When you have a lot of malcontents on the bench, knowing in their mind that they could do better, they should be out there, and so forth and so on, with little regard towards winning or losing, just the fact that they want to be there, that is your problem. So my biggest thought was to keep those guys on the bench happy and willing to contribute in any way that we wanted them to contribute towards winning. That was one of the key things, uh, a la Ramsey, a la Havlicek, and so forth. Bird missed that year, almost the whole year. It's the, uh, the heels, and, you know, he wrenched both heels. Uh, so he comes back the next year, and one of the very first exhibition games was in, in Worcester. And I'll never forget, he goes down, and after the game was over, Kevin says, I almost forgot how incredible it, it was to get those entry passes. You know, that Larry completely reopened up Kevin's game as yeah. only he could. And, and he so got him the ball he, exactly where he needed it. Exactly. And I mean, when, think about that, that lost art, right? Like, you need a guy, especially from Larry's position. Think of how valuable that was because, like, DJ wasn't the greatest passer. Danny wasn't the greatest passer. You had a guy at a spot on the floor that 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 was the elite passer, maybe in the NBA, other than Mag like you said, Magic Bird, whatever you want to say. And he could get him the ball, low post entry pass, not just get it to him, but get it to him exactly where he oh, needed. Oh, there it was a great uh, and and the individual chemistries he had, uh, he and DJ had an incredible little sub game going on in which DJ knew when to hit Larry when make his baseline. DJ would make a, a pass from half court and Larry would make a baseline cut. I mean, stuff you're never going to see again. You're never going to see. And then, of course, we won't even talk about Larry and Walt because that was like, that was criminal. That wasn't fair. When they played against the backup center, it was like, this is like a pick, it's cruel and unusual punishment. You know, you know they were, they were kind of. It's like a um, video game. CLNS History is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network.